Great. Well, uh, welcome uh, to another uh, edition of Ask the Expert. Uh, I am uh, Matthew Goodwin from Washington University in St. Louis. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. And I'm Wendy Gibbs from Barrow Neurological Institute, and I am a diagnostic and interventional neuroradiologist. So, Dr. Gibbs, first of all, thank you for being here again. We've done this before, and um, I got a lot of great feedback last time about uh, uh, some of the things you uh, mentioned, and in particular, as surgeons, we often are hanging out with other surgeons, and we don't always get um, a different view from someone who's not a surgeon. Uh, and so it's actually very helpful, uh, as we've talked about before. So we're going to talk about infection today, and I believe we're going to talk about discitis, osteomyelitis, and you're going to give us some insight about how you go about uh, diagnosing it on the imaging. Um, I know we've talked earlier about this or in the past, and one of the things I've mentioned is, does it see me and I don't see it in terms of um, uh, degenerative disease, uh, things that I think are degenerative changes on the imaging, but, but maybe it's infection that I'm missing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you look at the imaging when we suspect there might be uh, discitis and, and, and what imaging is the most helpful. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting topic. It's very much a multidisciplinary approach to patient care because um, we all have our different tools and training that help us treat these patients. So I do find that it is often, um, there's delayed diagnosis. So I think it's a relatively easy thing to treat sometimes, but patients are not treated. There's a lot of morbidity because the diagnosis is delayed. I think there are not clear symptoms. Imaging findings can be difficult. It's not always straightforward. And there's not always a clear algorithm to how to work up these patients, whether they're coming in through the ER, outpatient, whatever. The, um, the workup and kind of um, even the literature is very controversial about many of these things. In terms of the imaging, I think most people know that discitis osteomyelitis is best evaluated on MRI, if you can get it. Um, things like um, disc enhancement are very important, paraspinous, preretrieval paraspinal soft tissues, epidural enhancement. Um, those things are very characteristic. The literature says those are the most characteristic signs on MRI. Not everybody can get an MRI, so sometimes mm. people might get diagnosed by CT, end plate demineralization, things like that. Um, sometimes if you get a CT with contrast, you can see enhancement. For problem solving, if people can't get an MRI, you might be able to get PET, kind of like skull-based osteomyelitis. We can evaluate with PET, but a lot of radiation, so we don't often get that. So are you missing it? I just gave you all the clues. So maybe I am. <laughs> maybe I am. Um, so, yeah. well, the, the hard part from our view is probably that we see so much back pain, and we know that in discitis, the labs aren't always elevated. Um, and so I think it's hard. I think it's, I think we probably do miss it some. And, and I guess that's kind of... Um, yeah. So yeah, so what you just brought up was a good point. So back pain, the biggest mimic of discitis osteomyelitis is type 1 end plate changes, motive type 1 end plate changes. Um, with degenerative changes like this, you can have abnormal enhancement of the end plates, of the discs, of the soft tissues. So it can be really hard. So despite, you know, our best efforts on imaging, sometimes we do need to still biopsy these. Okay, so I'm seeing a patient and I'm seeing some of these things and I suspect there could be an infection. And I'm thinking back to us talking about it and saying, gosh, maybe I should make sure I'm not missing this. Um, and so I want a biopsy, I order a biopsy. And they're going to come to you for a biopsy. What are the what are the things you're thinking about? Um, are you, are, do I need to make sure they're not getting antibiotics, or can I start, or do I, should I start antibiotics? Do you care if they're on a blood thinner? You know all those things that that we do, and maybe we don't know if we're doing it right, or or maybe we're not doing it right. Yeah, that's that's a good question, and they come to us. So radiology plays a huge role, both the imaging and the biopsy. So for diagnosis, it's pretty much us, but we get these orders for biopsy, whether it's from the ER, a lot of patients come in the ER, you know, outpatient clinics, different medicine, ID, maybe you as a spine surgeon, like you said, you have a patient who has right. chronic back pain, maybe you're missing it, who knows, probably not you. <laughs> um, but so what I would say is, you know, we want first the imaging, we want to be convinced there's a possibility that's infected because we don't want to biopsy 
everybody because no procedures without risk, even right. though, you know, small needles is pretty straightforward for us. We would also ask that people get inflammatory markers, CRP, ESR, because in terms of pyogenic discitis, osteomyelitis, if the CRP is normal, likely not infected. Hmm. Um, atypical infection is a different story. But, um, and then blood culture. These are things that I often see that, you know, they, they order the biopsy and these things have not been done. Because if you have a positive blood culture, per the Infectious Disease Society guidelines, you do not need to get a biopsy because you have your bug. So get a blood culture. Usually we wait at least two days for that to turn positive. And in that case, you know, if you, if you have a positive blood culture, you don't need the biopsy. If you don't and you still suspect infection, then we will do the biopsy. And I would tell you, antibiotics, it's, it used to be that they would say you shouldn't be on antibiotics. It decreases our yield from maybe 50% to 30%. But more recent um, mid-analyses and different studies have shown that maybe being on antibiotics doesn't matter. Um, so we could still do the biopsy. We still might get the bug. And so 50% mm -hmm. is yeah. not very good. It's not very good. <laughs> so if you didn't have us, you'd be zero. But yes, go on. <laughs> right, right. So, so I can't put all my, I can't put all my hope and faith in the biopsy, I guess. True, true. Um, and well, so I would ask you then, wait, say you get your imaging and we think there's infection. I don't get anything. What do you do? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there certainly there are times when we are um, operating, whether there's a biopsy or not. Okay. Neurologic compromise, instability, um, epidural abscess, mm -hmm. things that at, at, at the cord level, things that we we think deserve an intervention immediately. Um, so, in, so in those cases, whether there's a biopsy or not, or whether we have any yield, probably doesn't matter um, a great deal other than for, for how they're going to be treated moving forward, right? You'd like, hopefully, surgically, you get a sample and, and maybe get something from that. Um, I mean, incidentally, those are also the indications for surgery, right? So I always yeah. teach the residents and fellows that discitis in general is a non-operative disease until, until it becomes operative. Right. And so with the non-operative disease and that most people are going to get treated with antibiotics, um, you want to have something to guide treatment, as you've been talking about, in terms of having um, a, a source or getting a biopsy uh, to get a source. And um, if they fail antibiotics, then uh, let's say they don't have neurologic compromise. There's no abscess. Um, there's no instability. And so they get it. But then they fail antibiotics. It might become surgical at that point as well. Right. That would be kind of the last indication uh, for surgery. And what does that mean? What is yeah, that? <laughs> that's a good question. Fail I don't think I don't think we always know. Um, and there's some uh, there's always some discussion about that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because we feel a certain way. I think about the imaging. You can tell me if that's correct or not. In that, you know, following discitis um, with an MRI may not be the answer, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the face of everything else clinically looking better. Um, and, and, but occasionally somebody else will order an MRI and say, hey, it looks the same. Two months mm -hmm. later, it looks the same. And we would yeah. say, maybe we don't care, but maybe we should care. Or, or maybe, maybe you can tell us when we should care on that, on that follow-up imaging or when we get it. That's a really good, good point because a lot of times the imaging will lag behind clinical, whatever, improvement resolution by a month to two months. So if anybody's ordering that MRI, in that period of time, it can look the same or it can even sometimes look worse, but be clinically better, in which case, you know, if, if it's better, you're not going to do anything, right? Right. right so, right. yeah. So if the, I would say it's a clinical decision. If these people are imaged, you do not make any decisions based on imaging in the post-treatment setting. If they are physically doing better, if they don't have their pain, if their markers are all back to normal, certainly you don't need imaging. Unless maybe, this is a question for you, if you're tracking them for a progressive deformity, mm. if that like if it was a bad infection mm -hmm. and there was mm -hmm. some deformity and that might progress even after they've been treated, maybe you'd want imaging in that scenario. Certainly, that's a good point. I mean, we would certainly, um, if, if there were uh, any component of instability or concern for deformity, we'd want upright plane films like always. Uh, and, and, and in that case, if they're progressing with their deformity, we, we probably would get more advanced imaging. That's exactly right. The um, so we would so we probably would get a new a new image at that point. You you mentioned um, or one of us mentioned maybe it was me maybe it was you an epidural abscess is part of this. Um, 
epidural abscess is not the point of this talk, but I'm going to mention it mm -hmm. for our last point here, just to kind of frame the, the, the question. You know, if somebody has an epidural abscess, um, we always say image the rest of the spine um, because you might miss an epidural abscess higher up somewhere else, et cetera. I don't know that that always happens with discitis. Um, I think sometimes we request it. I don't know that it always gets done. Sometimes they're off and they're getting treated. I think mainly because some of that, when it's non-surgical, is a little bit not in our hands at the time. Yeah. Should we be imaging the whole spine when they have? They get a lumbar MRI. They have something mm -hmm. that looks like discitis. They're getting antibiotics. Should they also be getting the rest of their uh, spine imaged? So two different answers to that. If it's discitis coming in, then um, there have been studies that show up to a quarter of people will have a non-contiguous level that also has another infection, whether that matters to you all or not. So you can have fast screening things through the ER where you look, if you find it in lumbar spine, look at the rest of the spine. It can be like just one sequence, even a sagittal sequence, and you can see if they have it anywhere else. In that one study, a quarter of patients had another level and over half of those ended up going to surgery, some kind of surgical intervention. Epidural abscess is a different thing because... So maybe this, so maybe that quarter, maybe Spelman mm -hmm. did have an epidural. They had something that indicated surgery, whether it's instability Possibly. or... Possibly. Yeah, yeah. So maybe and we should be imaging the rest of their spine all the time. How often do you see, if you have an epidural abscess in the lumbar spine, do you see one in the cervical spine or in the thoracic spine? Do you need that additional imaging? And would it matter surgically? I, I think we do because it's such a, um, it's such a high risk endeavor. You know, if they if you miss, even if it's a very low percentage, um, I don't think the percentage is that high, but um, but it's not certainly not zero, and um, and we see them, and uh, you probably know the number. You're probably you probably know the number, but it, but it's but it's certainly not that low, and uh, it certainly comes up every year. And the problem is if you miss one, well, a cord level epidural abscess, in some ways, is the opposite of this, in that it's usually a surgical thing, mm -hmm. unless there's a reason for it not to be surgical. Uh, because they could progress to having major neurologic deficits. See, this is fantastic, this kind of discussion, because these are a lot of the questions we have. Like, why are they getting the whole spine if they have an epidural abscess down here? I didn't know they could go to the cervical spine if you have it in the lumbar spine, things like that. So this is why it's great that we can have these talks, because I think our specialties don't always you know, have this right. chance right. to discuss these things. Why are we each doing what we do, or what are we looking for? So. Right. You just taught me some stuff. Thank you. Well, I always learn from these. <laughs> and um, uh, I think I learned as much uh, even talking to you about what we should talk about next as <laughs> I do when we talk about it. Um, so thank you for, for doing this and for joining us. And I think we've uh, we figured it out. I think, I think we have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>